Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Well, uh, Kiki, welcome to the to the show. Well, thank you, Dan. Sure. <laughs> uh, it's 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 an early morning. I think you might be the second earliest show I've ever done. I think the first, the earliest was like eight o'clock in the morning. But um, uh, but yes. So um, Kiki, let me ask you first: Is that your real name? No, Kiki is not my real name. My real name is Kristen. Um, my niece used to call me Kiki because she couldn't pronounce my name. So I went with it and I use it as my art name. That's so cool. Very, very cool. Very cool. My name isn't Don, but I go with it because my students started calling me that. So um, I was just like, what the hell is up with this? Um, so, I, you know, it's would, easier, shorter. Yeah, well, it, what, what they would say... Uh, would be Don Victor, right? Because mm-hmm. I go by my middle name, which is Victor. And uh, and then after a while, like after maybe the f- first year or whatever, working with these guys, they're like, Don Victor, Don Victor. I'm like, what, what the hell's up with that? Um, but people said, go with it. And I went with it and just kind of stuck since. But <laughs> uh, all right, Kiki. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, in your studio... What are you currently working on or outside well, of your studio? I'm working on so many projects right now. Right now I'm looking at this big bear I'm painting, uh-huh. which I started years ago. So I have multiple large paintings I'm working on for a gallery show, which I don't have a date yet for because I have to go visit New York and mm-hmm. meet the gallery owner I'm working with. So I have multiple gallery paintings. And then I also am working on a big mural in a friend's basement. And I am painting the new house I am going to be currently living in as well. Dang. So, By painting, yeah, you're just like painting things. the walls or are you actually yeah. painting murals in them? Okay. Uh, I'm just painting the walls. But I'm going to do a few like paintings for the house as well. Nice, nice. Now, what's crazy is like, yeah, uh, do you do any small illustrations or like, I call them illustrations, but like uh, paintings? Were they always like huge? Yeah. No, I have, I do do small ones. Like I recent, like I'll do small drawings or I recently got into Prismacolor. So I've been doing some illustrations with Prismacolor mm-hmm. or I really like to work with watercolor. So I'll do small illustrations with watercolor. But um, I, my main bread and butter is my gallery work, which is bigger. And what, when I talked to the gallery owner, she asked me how I felt, like what, did my like my intuition feel like what was best and I big work I love the big work so yeah so and I do what, a range and what medium are you using uh, acrylic okay okay and yeah. airbrush oh okay that makes sense really you're like pss, pss, that's cool <laughs> yeah very uh, like I very like so there's areas I'll airbrush just to help get the blending you mm-hmm. know real smooth but for the most part, acrylic, and I layer a lot, like lots of thin layers. Nice, nice. And do you, uh, those layers, are they created with water, or are you putting like a a, a medium in there? Um, water, I'll use water and a matte medium, or a, I think a satin glazing medium, which mm. extends the drying time. Okay, so it kind of so works a little more like oil then. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Very, very cool. Very cool. Um, now, do you consider yourself an artist or an illustrator? Um, I mean, my art is very illustrated based, 
Mm -hmm. Like you can, it it tells a story, but I consider myself an artist because I tend to be, I guess it's like artists, illustrators are artists. That's a weird question. I feel like art can be considered like you can see art as in many, many different aspects, you know, like what Mm -hmm. I'm doing with my kitchen, Mm -hmm. I'm going to be sanding the cupboards down and repainting it. And that's an art form, you know, interior decoration Mm -hmm. is an art form. So I consider myself an artist, not just an illustrator, because I apply art to many aspects of my life, especially playing with my son. You know, we got to play imagination and do that sort of thing. That's and, then, awesome. and you know, it takes, yeah, yeah, we play, we play Batman and we take rides in our rocket ship and go to the moon or whatever. And, it, you know, and then maybe that's more of the illustrator in me with the, the imagination. But you kind of have to have this imagination to be an artist and Indeed. visualize. Indeed. Indeed. Um, all right. Well, that, 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 that puts it there. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, how would you describe your kind of work? Because you have a very unique... I mean, you're really, really good at communicating your ideas and your stories visually, right? Um, mm-hmm. But you also have this very interesting uh, style or approach or take on what what you're communicating, and um, and I, I just find it very cool. I think you know, it, there's a lot of artists that I meet that are like you know, really great or good. Um, mm-hmm. but my, my friend used to always say, you have to find someone with that cool factor, the cool factor. And I think you actually have that like in spades, like you, you you just come off as cool. Um, your son comes off Thank as you. cool too. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> he's um, a cool little dude. <laughs> he's a cool little dude. See, like even in that, right? You have, like a, you have like a cool voice. Like when I was like, Oh, you know, like I've seen this person on Facebook or whatever. And. But then when I hear your voice, I'm like, oh, you know, it adds another level of personality. Yeah. Well, thank you. And your work, it just has like this cool factor. I feel like if I was just hanging around the work itself, I would be like cooler. I mean, like the Fonz. No, um, <laughs> the Fonz. <laughs> I'm sure like half the audience doesn't even know what that reference is. Um, no, I don't even know. Oh, you do, oh my god! I feel like I've heard it before. For you know, reason. oh my god! The other half of the audience is like, "What's going on?" You know, it's funny. My my brother's a, a magician, and so when he's on stage, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he he's really cool. Um, he just had this huge <laughs> uh, uh, article written about him in uh, like uh, mm-hmm. Southwest Airlines. So like, it's you know, all the people who are flying on the airplane are now reading his article. Um, but uh, he'll make these references like to the Smurfs or stuff, you know, snorks or what, like from when we were kids. And like mm-hmm. the parents get it, but the kids are like, huh? <laughs> it's just hilarious. But uh, um, the Fonz was a TV show called Happy Days back in when I was a kid. And it was basically like about the 50s or something. And the Fonz had like this white t-shirt and his cool leather jacket. And he was just like the cool guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I know what you're talking about now. Okay. And he looks kind of weird. Like he's like this furry yeah. thing. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, is that what you're talking no, about? No, he's a dude. He's a human being. He's a dude. Yeah, oh, he's okay. A, you got to look him up on the, the Fonz. <laughs> um, okay. And he would be like, yeah, and he had his little thumbs up. Anyways, he was just like the epitome of what was cool back in the day. And uh, and I just feel like your work has that energy. So um, so I'd like to know, uh, how would you describe your work? Um, that's like, that's one question. Um, well, it's very, it's very imaginative, but um, it's also kind of personal on some mm-hmm. levels. But um, like my friend calls it, um, I'm like an intuitive artist. So I go with what I'm feeling. Okay. And uh, and uh, so it's more like magic realism or what I call unrealistic realism. So I apply a lot of uh, like realistic lighting and and that sort of thing and the dimension to it. But mm-hmm. 
the the characters or the underlying messages like the or the the messages are pretty real but the characters and stuff are not nothing anything you would see in real life does Mm -hmm. that make sense absolutely so but then the way i paint them is they feel real and that's why i like to work so big because when you stand in front of it it just feels that much more real and so you know i so i call it unrealistic realism or some people could call it contemporary surrealism Mm. or magic real or magic realism so there's a very magical quality to it. And so, yeah. yeah I would, I, I yeah, would I agree with that. There's a magical quality to it. Um, and have you always worked big or is that more of a recent thing? Oh, I started working big in college. Um, mm-hmm. So I took, I dropped out of school for like a year and then I went back to school for illustration and we were doing a lot of digital stuff. So I'd, I'll do digital painting and that sort of thing, which is great. But I love the traditional and I love the, you know, you have the original. Mm. There's just nothing, there's nothing like an original. So I got really good at digital painting. And I started coming up with concepts in class. And I was like, I really want to do a big series, just a mm. series of these paintings. So I took one home and I ended up on my two week break painting one of them and bringing back into school. And they liked it so much, they allowed me to continue working in traditional media and working big instead of being on the computer, working small like a normal illustrator. I kind of went from being in illustration to being a painter in illustration. Mm -hmm. So they just they kind of just allowed it to happen because they really enjoyed the direction I was going with my work. That's cool. And they didn't kind of. Yeah, they didn't really want to like mess with that. So they were like, all right this is what you're, you know, you're going to focus on gallery work. So I focused on gallery work. Yeah. Except I ended up getting pregnant near the end of college. So, you know, having a son slowed everything down. Yeah. That'll happen. Yeah. But he's really, really awesome. I really love him. So things have been picking back up because he started school recently. Well, that's cool because you're, you know, it's weird. It's it's a kind of weird to say this, but the fact that you got pregnant in college, um, or at the end of college, I guess you're still in college, um, and you know, rather than like say five years after college, and then to kind of have that long, you know, that that slow spot, it's kind of cool that you had mm-hmm. that in the beginning, you know, and uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, you, you said that you took a year off from college and then you went back to uh and, and you went back to illustration were, were you going for illustration in the beginning your you know before you took off or were you going for something else i was going for uh, motion graphics actually oh thank but god I started you painting... quit that right okay <laughs> oh my god it was <laughs> like no offense it's fun no it's not that fun but I started painting in high school. My mom was like, well, you can't make money painting and doing this and that. I'm like, okay, well, so I just, I I don't know. So motion graphics came up as a thing. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, graphic design, but motion graphics takes graphic design to like another level. You know, you get to make animation and stuff, which is cool, but you're spending so much time on the computer. Mm -hmm. And I'm deep down, I'm still like a traditional artist. Like, I, I love the feel of painting and drawing and that sort of thing. So I did that for like a year and it was great, but I was, it was like not what I wanted to do at all. I was like, well, I'm good at this, but I'm not enjoying it. So I dropped out for a year and then I ended up helping like paint these murals in a bar mm. during that period of time I was out of school, so which got me back into painting and working big again. That's cool. Does that make- yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I have like a a long story, so everything kind of like, well, because this happened, this happened. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So no. when I went, yeah, I was just gonna. Um, so when I went when I went back to school, it was because I dropped out of school. Does that make sense? And Absolutely. then I started painting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I was like, oh, okay. I looked into illustration. And I was like, all right, this sounds like. I would, you know, enjoy this because my work is illustrated based, but I like to paint. No, instead that, of going for fine arts. That decision that you made to walk away from 
the uh, the uh, motion graphics. Um, after you took that that time off and you did the murals in the bar and stuff like that, did, did your mom support you in that decision, or or was she still concerned yeah. for you? Um, I think she was a little concerned, but once she got more information about illustration and how many like different directions you can go with it. And like, plus I still have the background in graphic design mm-hmm. slash motion graphics, which gives me, you know, it gives me, a, I, I design my own logos or I design logos for people if they really need mm-hmm. it. But <clears throat> so once she learned that like, there's a lot of fields you can go into with the illustration, she wasn't so worried about it. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. That's very cool. And, uh, now let, let's go back a little further than that, okay? A little, little further mm-hmm. than college. When did you, um, uh, like, fall in love with this art thing? Um. Well, my mom said I started drawing at like two, so I always loved art growing up, like drawing and our class, our classes and science classes were my thing, mm-hmm. ah, very and. Cool. But I never realized you could, like, grow up and be an artist. I actually saw once one person that really inspired me was this janitor in my elementary school. He came in, and he had all these super cool, like, alien and space drawings. I was like, whoa, you know? So that's when I started, you know, getting – I got myself, like, some self-taught drawing books. Mm -hmm. But there was a period of time where I started playing soccer and then school, you know? So I – growing up, I loved art. But then it kind of got pushed to the side for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then when I really started falling in love art again, like I took art class in high school, but when I really started falling in love is when I broke my leg. So I broke my leg playing soccer Mm -hmm. and I couldn't do anything. So I was stuck like in crutches in a wheelchair. And uh, so I started painting. That's when I started painting. And I was like, wow, you know, I miss this so much. It was like all those years I wasn't working on art or only having a taste of it here and there, it was like bottled up. Mm. So, so when I finally got the time to just, I mean, all I could do is sit around and like draw and paint. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And that's when I like, I mean, I always loved art, but when I really started falling in love with art was when I started painting again in high school. That's awesome. Very cool. So Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, broken leg, uh, was a blessing in disguise. And now Yeah, I always say that. Every <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I always say everything happens for a reason. Indeed, indeed. Um and now uh where are you from? Like I mean, you you went you went to SCAD, uh Savannah College of Art and Design. Um I happen to go there as well. And I think that's we didn't meet there, but we met on Facebook. Um Yeah. And I think you were still in school at the time uh, when I I remember some clown bear ish creature illustration mm-hmm. that you made. And I was like, freaking, hey, that's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just it was just so cool that I was like, all right, click. I've got to follow this person. Um, and uh, um, but like that's in Georgia. Like, where are you? Where are you from in the in the U.S.? I'm originally from Michigan. Oh, so Canton, Michigan. Dang. Yeah. What part of the hand is? Yeah, way up north. north. Okay. Um, it's over by the. I'm I'm like 30 minutes from Detroit, so I'm okay. a Detroiter at heart. Yeah. Wow. Gotta love Detroit. Detroit's full of weirdos. Awesome. <laughs> it really is. That's it's awesome. Funny. That makes a lot of sense now. Huh. I, I, I had the uh the great privilege of training a group of Michigan artists. And um it was very interesting because their work ethic was insane. It was like uh it was weird. It was it was like watching plumbers. I, I don't know how to explain it, you know, but like I know they, what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about because Michigan people were like really, it's like built for tough, like 
we're like the people that if you want to get anywhere in life, you got to like work really hard at it. I don't know if it's because of all the, there's a lot of bad stuff that's happened in Detroit and Flint and uh, I don't know if it's just like, that's how when you're, when you're growing up near a city that like used to be like so great and it fell apart and now it's starting to rebuild and it's, I don't know. Hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think also, Added to that is just that huge blue collar, um, I think they call it a meme. Now, not a meme like you see on Facebook, right? Um, but mm-hmm. I think uh, in sociology, the meme is kind of like what genes are to a person, memes are to a society. So they're like these, this, this DNA of the culture. And, um, mm-hmm. and I think like that blue collar work ethic you know almost like i almost get that <laughs> i can't believe i'm gonna say this maybe i shouldn't say that um just say it just say it i'm gonna say it because it's it's fresh in my head i i, I don't know if you've seen this uh roseanne there was a tv show called roseanne yes they restarted it they restarted it. i just watched it last night my brother's like you gotta watch the new roseanne and i, I watched Roseanne is so great yeah yeah and it's just like that, like, I don't know, that blue collar, you know, s- simpleness, um, but in, 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 not in a negative way, just, you know, it's just a simpleness, right? It's like, hey, I want to be an artist. Therefore, I have to get up every day and go to go to work, you know? And, uh, yeah. And there's just, I, I love that. It, it's very, very cool. And it was neat to work with, you know, this group of five or six women and just see that kind of ethic over and over and over again. And, um, and the work that they produced was just beautiful. It was, it was crazy. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. So um, you, you went off to university. Uh, since, since then, will this be your first gallery show that you're putting together for uh, the place in New York? Or have you had a few you know other shows well this will be my first solo show but oh, i've okay. put like other small small works into different galleries so i've had just a very few just but for the most part i've kind of just i'm like working on just keeping my work more on the down low right now mm-hmm. while i build this series so i'm still working on building the series and i have multiple other people's pieces but yeah i haven't had a solo show because I graduated school five months pregnant. So when I moved home, I was focused on, you know, being pregnant, building a nursery and that sort of thing. Indeed. And then when you have the little one, uh, you, you lose five years as an artist. I, I, I don't know how artists can do it. Um, you know, I had two kids and when I would bring them into the studio you just can't concentrate, you know, and then you're terrified that you're gonna, they're going to spill something on me or whatever. Yeah, at least for me, I like. Uh. Um, but, <laughs> but then that's the thing about working with acrylic. You can like he'll go spray my work with like a water bottle or like get stuff on it. I'll be able to wipe it off and be like, it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it so much. Uh well, for me it was like uh, I was like a nervous wreck. I'm like ah, and so I was like. Eh, I'll just wait a couple more years and just let them play, you know, and just be with them. So, uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah. Now, now they're at an age, like I, I sat my daughter down, she's 10 now. And I said, Hey, I've given you 10 years of passion. Where you could just play and fall in love with art making. Now I train you. Right. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. So now um, I train you, young Padawan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. what it's like. Yeah. Well, you yeah. guys like build their imagination. Right now, it's like working on imagination and personality. And now, yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome>. yeah. <laughs> you know, I remember like strategically putting the love of art in my daughter at two years old. Like, um, like I remember sitting down and I just had this idea. I was like, wait, this is how I'm going to do it. 
And she was obsessed with Elmo, right? And I yeah. said, Sophie, come here. I put her in a little chair. I think we actually recorded it because I, I just knew it was going to work. And Okay, this is a good idea. So I'm going to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what I did was, what I realized is that if you want to anchor, I call it anchoring, anchor a thought in a child, you got to use what they naturally love. Because they're not like, and then you just associate it with that thing, right? So she loved Elmo. And she's looking at the blank piece of paper, and I begin to draw Elmo, right? And she freaked out. Like, it, like, how did her best friend just come out of nothing? Yeah. She was sold. She was sold. Like, she, I don't think she's going a day without drawing, creating something since, you know? And yeah. And then when she was younger, I was trying to like train her, but I could tell like she was getting frustrated. And then I I, I had to come oh, to yeah. terms with that and realize, you know what, back off, just just give her a couple years, you know, just just let her Kids love. Get frustrated. Her. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, uh, so now she's now she's ready to learn, and um, that's. And, and how how old is your son? He's three. Three, wow. So he's yeah. You yeah. got a couple more years, but um, yeah. Now you, now you said you 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 he's he's going off to school now, right? Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, do you use that time to do more work now? Oh yeah, yeah. So it's a nice chunk of time to get work done. But he like loved school. He needed to be in school. He needed something like just playing at home wasn't enough. He loves learning. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was, it's been great for him, and it's been great for me. It gives me a nice window to, you know, get some work done. And then yeah. when he comes home, I go pick him up, or I pick I go pick him up from school, and then I get you know play time with them. So. It's a nice, nice balance. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. five to 10 years from now, where do you see yourself? Where do you, you know, your little guy will be somewhere between eight and 13 and uh, just kind of crazy thought when you think about it. Um, yeah. that's nuts. <laughs> He'll be looking down on me. Um, but you're in your that daughter space. will be driving a car. I know, <laughs> right? Ah, ooh, ah, ee. um, and my son. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I always wonder, like, when they're when my son's about fourteen and she's seventeen, if he's going to be like the little brother who's always want to hang around with his older sister's friends, or I I think it might go the other way around, where he's going to be so cool. That my sis, my my daughter's friends will be like, oh come on, let's go hang out with Sally, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like, I love the scenarios you're coming up with. It's really great. <laughs> you know, the other day, uh, uh, she had she wanted to have a play date, right? And I'm like, oh my god, if she has a play date, my son's gonna be like banging on the door, doing all that stuff. So, um, so I called their mom and I said. Hey, why don't I take the the boy out and we'll go do something together, Daddy, and Sunday, um, and uh, <laughs> just so, just so my daughter could have some friend time without her little brother being a pest, you know. <laughs> but uh, um, okay, five to ten years. Where do you see yourself? Like, what would you? What would be? Where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? Um, I'm hoping to be doing gallery work and murals. So mm. that's what I'm hoping. Um, but nothing ever goes to plan and things always change. Let's be honest. <laughs> so many things have happened in my life to where it's like, well, we can plan for this, but it's going to change. So, um, but that would be my main focus is gallery work and murals. Cause I really love the gallery work. But like being able to work really, really big Mm -hmm. would be really, you know, that's why I started doing a mural, you know, trying to pick up some mural work here and there now so I can build my portfolio and have work to show for that. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. and not just like my zombie stuff, you know, some people are like, 
oh, well, it's, it's all you do is just like scary. I'm like, no, 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 no. I can, I can do what it, draw, paint, whatever you want, you know. Just yeah, zombie rats and bears. Wanna... And... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although but I would think yeah, that would be huge do. now. I don't, uh, you know, you could probably uh, do those in like movie theaters or something. Um, yeah. So basically you, you, in five to 10 years, you really kind of just want to be still doing what you do today, but just at a, at a higher capacity, right? Like yeah. more frequency, um, mm-hmm. which is good. Uh, the, in, in terms of a gallery show, like how do you envision that? Like what, what does that look like for you? Um, so like what, what I'm going to have at the show pretty much, like I'm probably, yeah. I'm going to have several. Um, so the theme kind of changed mm-hmm. and, uh, and it was just going to be like mostly circus themed, but like circus as in like the world's kind of a circus. Mm-hmm. and it's a bit crazy and nutty so i convey like messages with that but instead i'm changing it and um i'm going with like uh mirror mirror so um it's more of my basically a reflection of how i feel about the world so i've been able to include so now i can like include more of a range rather than just a circus theme Mm-hmm. I just don't want to be that person that does the solo show. And then you're that person that just does circus stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. So this is, yeah. So mirror mirror represents, it's like I'm exploring reality basically. And um, so I'm going to have several large pieces and then smaller ones to go with it. And then I'm designing like a, a piece for the, I guess the title or the name of the show. So I have a painting I'm designing for that. And then I would like to have performers there as well, hmm. which I think would be fun. Like circus performers? Yeah, not, yeah, circus performers, but like uh, just different types of art performers as well. Okay. Okay. Like, gotcha. Yeah. So I want it to be like a whole encompassing show. Now you you, you said that you it's called mirror mirror. Yeah, mirror mirror. Okay, I'm mirror, still mirror deciding between circ. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't uh, sure uh, when you said mirror mirror. I was thinking like a meerkat type of mirror, you know. Um, yeah. But, okay, so it's mirror mirror. Okay. Uh, mirror mirror. And so that would be like different. Um, you're just looking at reality in different perspectives or from different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's mm-hmm. cool. That's cool. And what, what are some of the, the uh, concepts that you are, are contemplating? So, so I have the circus thing going on. So mm-hmm. that involves the world and how I feel like the world, it can be a circus. Mm-hmm. And then I have uh, a, whole, a series of, uh, I guess, um, space and, um, I guess more futuristic art Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. then I'm going to be doing a series of skateboards which I'm hopefully going to do a larger series of paintings of these but of um, chess pieces because so chess symbolizes how you approach life when the way you play chess is the way how you approach life it's a strategical game but there's a lot of symbolism underlying symbolism with the pieces so I'm going to do 10 skateboards um, five of of the main white pieces and the five the main black pieces and the pawns mm-hmm. will just be like in the background or whatever. So there were rep- and that's what mirror mirror, it's going to be white and black because it's like representing this light and dark. So mm-hmm. the show mm-hmm. eventually it's going to be called mirror mirror, finding the light in the darkness. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of my work conveys like dark messages or whatever, but it's painted like, you're like really cool or really pretty, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, so I'm having dark, I'm going to have a lot of dark pieces and then I'm going to have a lot of, um, I guess, positive pieces as well. So it's going to be a nice balance between light and dark. Hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. I would like oh, to challenge you on that a little bit. Okay. If you don't mind. Um, no, I don't mind. It's interesting. This is where I would challenge you on it. Not not on the artwork or even the concept. 
but in the language. And um, because it was interesting, you know, you were saying dark pieces, and then you said, well, you know, maybe some more positive, right? And um, I have this little spiritual mentor guy. I mean, he's not little, but uh, well, I guess he is kind of a small guy. Um, uh, his name's Bill. And at my school, we call him the, uh, the CYO, the chief Yoda officer, because he just comes out with like this wisdom out of nowhere. And one of the things he's been having me work on for the last year or so is being very careful to assign moral value to certain ideas. And mm-hmm. um, so sometimes when we think of darkness, we think, we'll call it darkness, but like, we'll then subscribe to it like this, this concept that it's bad or negative or naughty or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we'll say, well, the light then is good. And. Oh, this is the fun part. You're going to like this. You're going to like what I'm going to have to say. So keep going. going. And it's a really neat challenge in life to actually try to suspend a moral judgment on both of them and just let them be what they are and say, wow, mm-hmm. you know, the light is necessary. The dark is necessary. The light may be just be uh, is awareness where darkness may be unaware of something. And mm-hmm. you, you know, uh, and, all, and oftentimes in life, the things that are lit up that you think you're aware of, <laughs> if you dig deeper into them, or actually, if you're going to put a moral judgment on, tend to a lot of times actually become the negative, you know? Um, yeah. Where there's, there's incredible gifts if, you're, if you have the courage to go into your own darkness, you know? And, 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 and in there, there's this beautiful light and truth, but it's scary as shit to go in there. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, so uh, that's that, that's what my challenge would be is just to throw it out there and um, and and, and I, to, I I know you're, yeah to to find it's it's about finding balance. So that's where mirror mirror comes in. I'm going to have one one like the words are going to be flipped, so reflected. Mm-hmm. So one's going to be white and one's going to be black. But the white side is going to convey like things you would think are positive or or not even necessarily positive, just aware of, but also convey a dark message behind them. Like there's so many great, beautiful things like 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 it's like there's always a dark side to the light side and there's always a light side to the dark side. Mm -hmm. And you can't just just view and then in between these mirror mirror is going to be like basically um a spectrum or rainbow because they're both connected and they're intertwined. One, you're right. One, you cannot have the dark without the light. And you can't have the light without the dark. Yank being and yang. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I've spent a lot of time, like when I work on my dark paintings, I'll, I'll think about, you know, I self reflect on lots of things. So myself and the world and, and it is scary to go into the darkness, but it can be quite fun and it can be quite eye opening because you start seeing it in the world more, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, there's because there's so many people in the world that convey themselves that this is so good and they're so great or so. But really, they have a lot of dark side to them. Mm-hmm. It's like um, and I like to say, like, people are like books. OK. You know, some people are easy to read, some people are more difficult. And the world's like a library, and it's full of all these stories, and everyone has a story. Mm-hmm. But in every story, you're going to have light and dark. So those are the messages I'm trying to convey in my art, that not everything is what – it's like uh, Mirror Mirror as in uh, – like or Alice in Wonderland, you know. Not everything appears – not everything, you know, it appears one way. Mm-hmm. It, it's it, – it's like, and you know, how many people wear masks or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you, yeah. So it's really trying to understand like where I fit in the world. And that's when it's a reflection of how I view the world because it's, the world is so beautiful, but there's so much darkness at the same time yet. 
a lot of without without that dark, you cannot have the light either. It's a weird combination. So, yeah, it's it's like that whole Alice in Wonderland. Not everything seems it's not what it all seems to appear, and not everyone mm-hmm. like what people say. You know, not everyone says what they mean. If that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Indeed. So, yeah, and. So- it's just trying to find balance. I think everyone's trying to find balance. Yeah, I think um, it's strange because uh, you know, with all the people you meet in your in your life, it's interesting how scared so many people are. Scared, yeah, uh, or terrified, just just with fear all the time. But they hide it with the illusion of light. You know, like, hey, yeah. you're smiling or we have a little happy family or whatever, right? Or, or you know, it seems like we have everything together, you know? Um, <clears throat> and yet they're terrified because they, there's a reality that everything that they look like they have can just totally fall apart, you know? And now yeah. when it falls apart, now they're vulnerable, they're naked, they're shamed, there's guilt, there's, you know, because they so many people live lies and and yes the world is like a big fucking lie like (laughs) and that's where it's like like i love the world but there's so many lies in the world like it's mind-blowing it's mind-blowing and people are so afraid to just be themselves or be real yeah and in part of it is I'm, i'm and it's weird like if everyone was just real in themselves I have no idea what the hell would ever happen to this world because I, I it's like the system or the systems that are created are created really for a mass mentality. They're not, it's not created for individual uh, individuals and no, uh, you know, and, and, and you, it's like, how do you control them? How do you, you know, <laughs> like how, how do you, project and you know and and try to have some sense of uh quote order and civility um when when you don't have the ability to tell somebody hey you're wrong or you're right and uh yeah it's crazy crazy it's like total chaos it's like total chaos but it all works for some reason all at the same time yeah yeah i remember this sometimes uh uh-huh oh i was but it's sometimes it's just, like you said, the system or like people get like lumped and that's like public schools and stuff, you know, it's great. We have school or whatever, but there's, and not until I got to college, I didn't really feel like I fit in anywhere. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So okay. it's, yeah, there's like, there's like so many sides to and perspectives to everything. It's like, yeah, we have schools and this is great. And, you know, kids are learning and this and that, but then also there's the dark side where it's like, well, you're also producing a lot of robot, you know, robots or mm-hmm. people that just, yeah, there's no. Or you yeah, go to art school where most people will end up becoming a freelance artist, right? And the reality is most artists, most artists are small businesses. And yet there's almost next to no business course or class in a school, in, in art school, right? No one's te- mm-hmm. telling you how to manage your books. <laughs> like no one's telling you like how to set up a business. No one's telling you how to manage that business, right? They're like, Oh, just paint pretty pictures and, you know, find an agent. Um, or, yeah, okay. <laughs> or, or, or they fill your head with this fantasy of there's jobs out there, you know, I, I read no, you this. have to work for those jobs. Man. <laughs> exactly so it's and i think that's part of the darkness and the lie as well you know so they they're using light and then people have this false hope and then i read this article the other day where over 90 percent of art students within two to three years after college leave the art field and they they, because they got you know they need to make money so they go you know, and become a waitress somewhere. I don't know. Um, or they leave the field altogether and move on to, you know, life. They have this huge debt over their head now. Um, yeah. 
but uh, but ninety over ninety percent leave the art field within two years after uh, college, two to three years after college. <clears throat> Insane. Um, that is crazy. That's crazy. That's like that's a huge number. It's like, and uh, and that's what our country is built upon, this false hope of you can, you know, make your dreams happen, but you really have to work towards that really hard, you know? And as you're trying to make your dreams happen, you're getting like fucked over by debt and uh, student loans and shit like that. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's just everything in this country is bought and sold. It's like in that giant advertisement. You know, it, it, when I was uh, in high school, um, I was in this one foster home, and every year we would go to the shore, Jersey Shore. And I remember uh, the foster. Sorry, the show, the show. The show. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, the Jersey. Those <laughs> fucking idiots. <laughs> we go down the yeah, yeah. wood, and I remember I was excited because. We we were going to the shore after you know school was ending and we we were going to go down there, um, and for some weird reason, uh, the mom came and picked me up, and we were driving and I was like, huh, this is weird. Like we're not going back to the house, and we were just driving and driving and driving, and I'm like, uh, why? This seems really familiar for some reason. And we were just going out into the country and we, and then I realized where we were going. Uh, there was this old like farmhouse and she goes to pull in and I'm like, I've been here before. Where, where is this? That's oh, and what it was, was a shelter for kids. Right. And so, yeah. so what she did is uh, she just like kind of dropped me off at this shelter for a week or whatever while the family went to the uh, shore. And, um, and what was crazy is the, the foster home I was in before that foster home, that before that foster home, the people I was living with actually owned the foster care agency. So I remember being young and going with my foster father when he purchased the, when his company purchased that farm, right? I didn't know that they mm -hmm. turned it into like this shelter for foster kids. But so I'm in this shelter and I get in and they begin to tell me all of the rules of the shelter. And I'm thinking to myself, as they're giving me all these rules, I'm like, oh, what the hell's going on here? Like, and what I realized in that moment was what I call the system. And I see it everywhere that systems are put into place and they're, and they, they're, they're designed for the lowest common denominator. And it didn't matter if I had an IQ of five or if I had an IQ of like 400 uh, it didn't matter if I was like the most irresponsible person or the most responsible person. It didn't matter anything. It was like they had this idea, this avatar of what, a, a, you know, in this case, a foster kid was, and then built a system around it. And you had to live according to this system, which was insane. Uh, I remember the, you're being put in a box. E exactly. And I, I remember I being, <laughs> yeah, and that, that was like that moment when it just all dawned on me. I was like, holy crap, this is evil. Uh, just, just evil because there were people there who, you know, who, who didn't need all that stuff. There was this kid there who was mentally uh, uh, re retarded and uh, handicapped and um, he was a cool kid, but like, you know, he had the, he had problems, right? And he needed help. And mm -hmm. the system that I was forced to live under for that week was the same system that he was forced to live under, right? And uh, and and I'm like, well, what, what? You know, like it, it was it was crazy. And uh, and so ever since then, I've kind of just had like this little, um, 
I don't know what the word is, but like this little uh, irritation. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I just see it for what it is, which is kind of just a mechanism to kind of sedate people, keep them in control, uh, keep them pacified, you know, and really yeah. to to obey the, rules. obey the rules and 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 play the game, you know. Um, and that's where the whole chess piece stuff comes in. Okay, this chess piece series mm-hmm. I'm doing is life is like a game. Okay, it's like a strategy, but in life you're dealt a certain deck of cards, kind of like mm-hmm. risk. Okay, you're dealt cards, but how you play those cards is very important. And either you get stuck in the system, or you figure out a way to get out of it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, when you said that, my mind went off to. Do we actually ever get out, or is that an illusion as well? <laughs> oh God, it's like the rabbit hole you keep going yeah. down. Yeah, technically we don't. I mean, this whole like, there's like so many systems upon systems. It's like every state has its own different laws you have to obey by, and it's like everywhere you look, there are rules. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can do this. You can't do that. It doesn't matter where you go, what building you go to. It's mm-hmm. like. When did this happen? When did all of these, like, I understand, like, following the rules here and there, and, you know, you know, just to be a good, as long as you're being a good person, like, come on, man. Like, do you have to have all of these rules? <laughs> That's. And then when you go to art, you do art, there's rules in art, too. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. It, it's, it's a weird this, thing because it, um, it. You can bend the rules yeah or master them i guess and and that maybe that's where the art comes in so you know the rules i guess might be the science of living right the science of mm-hmm. doing these things because it's really the how and the what of of life but then you bring in the art which then infuses within that how and that what the why's and the who's like who am i why am i here right what's my my mm-hmm. unique function in this thing called life this system and, um, and you know, I mean, it's interesting because you look at nature and you see nature's built on systems and, you know, flocks fly together. They, you know, there's, there's really very little chaos in, in nature itself. Um, I mean, one could say there's a lot of chaos, but. Yeah, there's so much chaos, but it's well, also very organized. It all works together. That's and, and the whole exactly. theory of everything. You know, it's, it, it, it seems chaotic, but it works. But but it works, and there's harmony to it. And you know, I I, I remember there was this one cool movie called I think it was called I Am. It was it was put together by the oh, guy. Oh yes, you saw that? He almost like that. No, but I saw yeah. a commer- or like a thing for it. I'm like, you go watch it. Like, it is an it is incredible. It's incredible. Like how everything is connected. I fucking love. I love yeah, that yeah. And one of the things he he brought up was that. In the, I guess the origin um, or origin of species or whatever by Charles Darwin, there's yeah like the, he makes this comment about um, the survival of the fittest, and mm-hmm. he says you know we've taken that and we built this whole life philosophy off of the survival of the fittest, and yet uh, Darwin talked far more about the love and the cooperation of nature than that like he mentioned that like a few times maybe just once i don't know but it was very very rare but what he talked more about was this incredible um uh, collaboration and working together and cooperation this harmony this and he called it i think he called it like this love that was out there uh in nature and um but no one talks about that, yeah, because <laughs> it's 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 more beneficial to uh, destroy each other. Um, so it's, if if you can, I think it's on Netflix. Watch it because it's uh, it was an incredible documentary, incredible documentary. Yeah, and I like the cover actually. If you go look at the cover of it, mm-hmm. it has all these little pictures. You know, you know those um, you know those pictures or those art pieces where it's like. From far away, it looks like a picture. Yeah. When you get close up, it's made up of all sorts of little separate pictures. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it makes, you know, so from, and that's why I like, I like to view reality. It's, from far away, you can see reality and like how it is and exactly what it is. 
when you get close up, you realize reality is made up of so many different stories and everything is interconnected to make the bigger picture. That's it. That's it. So, yeah, and that's what the cover is. It's all these different photos combined together to make a picture of the world. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, and we are, we're even, we're a part of a huge system. So we have all these illusion systems, these false systems, like, you know, we got laws and stuff to keep in order or whatever, you know, school rules, whatever. But at the end of the day, we're a part of an even bigger system, which we really don't have any control over, which is everything, you know, everyone's reality. It's the whole butterfly effect. And, and and, And we can think of it like, laterally like going let's say left you know let's say east no west to east like internationally right like we're much bigger than just Mm -hmm. our country or ourself or whatever like we're connected to all the other living things and people on the earth but then we can also flip that and go north and south and say we're also intergenerational and Mm -hmm. so there might be something like a repeating story that actually goes from your grandparents to your parents, to you, to your kid, you know? Um, So for example, uh, to help brainwash my children into understanding the importance (laughs) of gender. I call it brainwashing because that's, you know, strategic design. Yeah, essentially what it is. (laughs) Uh, You know, like in my family manifesto, one of the things, um, uh, how do I say this? Okay. This is what I'm saying. Um, knowing that the time in which we live in, that my daughter and my son will be going to school where the schools will begin to encourage alternative lifestyles, which I have no problem with people who they want to, what they want, you know, who they want to love and this and that. Yeah. For my house, it's extremely important that my kids understand the importance of carrying on our lineage okay yeah Mm -hmm. and so to counteract the culture now if my daughter came home and said she was gay we would deal with that i'd love her whatever right but to counteract Mm -hmm. the culture that's going to try to push her into one way or my son into one way uh, i put in our family manifesto that we live for our descendants right and so they're like, mm-hmm. what's a descendant, right? So the other day, my, my, my daughter went through this. That's actually the first thing she actually learned to read was our family manifesto. So I oh, introduced cool. it to my son. Um, and so we were talking about what are descendants and da, da, da. And so we came up with this cool idea because uh, um, when, I was, when I grew up, I, I wasn't a really good reader. That's probably why I listen to audio books and all that stuff now. I'm still not a great reader. And Audiobooks are the best. They are, are right? Because <laughs> you're oh like working God. away and podcasts. Yeah, and, and you're learning. Doing. So you're paint, you're working exactly. and learning at the same. Oh, I <laughs> listen to audiobooks on physics like all the time. It's like oh, the really best. on physics. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because you were like oh into gosh. science. Yeah, I'm super into science. So my son is like all about the science books right now. That's what he wants me to read him when he. That's back. awesome. <laughs> very, very cool. Very cool. So, um, so my son, like he loves reading, right? Um, so he's only seven. So we started this thing where we're, where we're going to do 50 books and we call it, uh, he came up with the name. It's called Grandpa Solly, right? And he's, he's, we're recording him reading 50 books to his grandchildren, right? <gasps> so, That's trippy. Exactly. So when you go, what a trip. <laughs> <laughs> so to intentionally design for like your great grandchildren, yeah. Just imagine, like, you know, your great grandkids, like, a kid like reading it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's even trippier because it's like a kid's voice. <laughs> it's a, and he's on video, and you're watching your great grandfather read you a book when he was your age done generations before intentionally i mean there's just, <laughs> ugh, it's cool and <laughs> but yeah it, it's but when your mind when you start to expand like oh wait we just aren't here to affect the people that are alive now but generationally like i think about as a teacher a lot of the people i train right now are adults 
but mm-hmm. I'm bold enough and idiot idiotic enough and crazy enough to say that I'm going to die on Saturday, September 19th, 2076, the year before I turn one, the day before I turn 100 years old. Right. And, and I'm going to, and I believe it. And guess what? If I'm wrong, I won't be around to, (laughs) to care. So, um, but, but I'm putting it in my head, like I'm going to die on this day. And it's weird, it's strange, it's one of these dark things, right? But there's a gift in it. And one of the gifts is you start asking yourself very interesting questions like, if what I am really... I going to do between now and then? Exactly. And you break it down into 10 year, 20 year projects, right? Um, and then this is the crazy part. I teach people now, but almost all my family outside of my kids and maybe my nieces and nephews, if, if this occurs, I will outlive them all. I will outlive all my students because most of my students are older than me. And then I realize, holy shit, like the people that I'm actually going to truly affect the greatest may not even be born yet. Like in 20 years, I'll be like 62, right? In 30 years. And you're still kicking good. Yeah. Right. And I'm teaching. Exactly. And I have this influence. I have 30, 30, 40 years now behind my belt, uh, belt training artists, this and that. And so if I'm dealing with 20, 30 year olds at that point, some of them won't, aren't even born or they might just be like five year olds, you know, five year olds now. Right. And that, Mm -hmm. that's, that's a freak, freaky concept to realize like, Everything you're doing you have now. that sort of effect. Exactly. And it's like, how do you prepare I, for that? Mm-hmm. You, you can, but you can't at the same time. Like you can only, you can only prepare so far, but like, I always tell like kids are the future. The kids are the future, you know? And that's why a lot of my artwork changed after I had my son. Mm-hmm. It started being more future oriented or like I did this big, you know, environmental piece. Cause I'm like, Oh my God. You know, when you start realizing how, you know, there's a lot of just a lot of bad companies just when you watch too many documentaries and things like that on the world you start realizing how like how much can happen within 10 years or Mm -hmm. you you know what I mean and it's like you start worrying like oh my god 30 years from now uh our oceans could be gone like just complete not like gone but when you have like I'm super into the science, like when you have the ecological web and you start really fucking with the lower, you know, the, the small parts of the web, you know, mm-hmm. it's all connected. So when you start messing with that, you're going to really screw up the rest of the web big time. And um, so we have global warming, we have all these different things and whatever people mm-hmm. say it's not happening, but you're, you're lying to yourself. You know, we've had industrial revolutions like up the wazoo within the past hundred years Mm -hmm. and that sort of in our world can't like we're changing things are changing technology and everything is changing so fast it's hard for nature to keep up and Hmm. like and you just you you start thinking you're right you start thinking about okay what's going to be like in 20 30 years you know there's 7 billion people on this planet something's gonna have to give some something's gonna have to happen because uh, the amount of rate people are multiplying is ridiculous mm-hmm. and food consumption is like out of control and, and our world is not that big people. It, it's a big people. All oh, the world's so big. It is big, but reality it's, it's not that big when you compare it to a lot of other things. So I, I get more concerned in the fact that like, I worry about the chill arch kids future and like teaching important things like, yo, we need to recycle. We need to, you know, try and, we need to try and do as many things as we can to prevent, you know, to make sure our kids have a future. Indeed. But yeah. Indeed. So that's what I go. I go down the rabbit hole of, of that. Yeah. That's, uh, and, in it's interesting. Like I, I'm not afraid of humans messing with nature. Uh, in the point that you know we 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 destroy it, um, 
but mm-hmm. I am concerned that nature has been here much longer than we have been. Um, and that it has a way of self cleaning itself, you know, and, and mm-hmm. so if, uh, if it needs to flood, flood it out or earthquake it out or, um, it's going to happen. Know, it's going to, it's going to cleanse itself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I often think about like the, you know, the ice age, you know, there was no, you know, there was no man-made stuff that made that happen yet. It happens. Right. And, um, mm-hmm. And I don't know the science behind this, if this is even possible or if this is just a, a crazy thought. But I, I remember hearing something where, like, you can get so much snow on the 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 um, the snow caps, right, that it becomes so heavy that it can actually shift the globe. Now, again, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know if that's scientifically even possible, but um, I remember watching this documentary on something and they were talking about this shift. And that's one of the reasons why they believe like, like in the middle of the Sahara or whatever, you'll see like fish bones because at one time that was maybe like an ocean and then the, the globe shift. And yeah. And that's why, you know, some places then all of a sudden get frozen, you know, and then, or melt or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's like can, self-evolving and molding. It's yeah. like constantly molding itself. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I <laughs> But we're a part of that. That's what's weird. It's like we mm-hmm. say like, oh, this is man made. We made these buildings, but we are made from nature. So you know, mm-hmm. and and it's like people oh, you know, cities are unnatural or whatever, but really we designed them and the nature designed us. So mm-hmm. Like you, and, it, it's, and it's, it's strange, like, you, you know, like when you were saying about uh, when you're working on the digital stuff, right? Um, and that you wanted to go back and you, you, you do the traditional work. You know, I, I remember when I was in college working on the digital, um, remember working on the old styluses and stuff. And then I went and I painted and you could feel the, the wood of the brush, Right was so different mm-hmm. than that cold plastic and it might have mm-hmm. just been the warmth of my own hand being absorbed into the brush and then being pulled back or like the smell of paper you know papers made out of wood yeah like you can feel the warmth of of a newspaper if you're reading a newspaper versus or a book or something like there's this interesting connection even though it's it's dead nature quote unquote um so you you feel this energy in it, and uh, yeah, you feel more connected. Yeah, less, less robotic in a way. Yep, Kenyon Cox uh, in in one of his books called A Classic Spirit. He was a an artist and an art critic and a writer and and stuff. Um, and he talked about the he was talking about the decline of art at the turn of the century, and uh, one of the things he said is because of the industrial res- revolution was coming and everybody was flocking to cities and things like that, that he was like, the artists need to get back to nature. They need to go spend time in nature. They're not doing that enough. And, Mm -hmm. and he was, he was saying that that's going to, that the consequence of that is the art is going to, it's going to fall away. Um, It's going to lack personality too. Ah, that's a great way of putting it. And depth. It's going to lack. Yeah. And depth and this, and that's why I do as an artist, if I like were to give advice, that's what I do as an artist all the time is I go, go for, I mean, especially when it's warm, like mm-hmm. in Michigan, we have a lot of cold months, but I'm, I spend a huge chunk of my time, not just working on art, but listening to books, listening to documentaries, learning, always learning, trying new things, trying new experiences, going in nature, going to museums and, you know, seeing the past and then experiencing you know thinking about the future and then experiencing just life in general you got to appreciate mm-hmm. life you can't just be black yourself you know in a room and just paint every single day and not get out and have experiences because then what are you what are you going to be painting about exactly you know exactly yep you know there's there's if art is a, a form of communication you know it's interesting i know a lot of people call it expression 
And I, I don't no, like it's communication as well. But it, that's what it is. You know, ultimately it's like to, a baby expresses itself. When it learns the language, it communicates an idea, right? It communi- so it might be like, nah, 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 nah. you know, you don't know what the hell it's saying. Yeah. Unless you know Dunstan baby language system, which then breaks it down to five grunts, and then you can actually decipher what your baby wants. That's a free one. Mm-hmm. Um, gr- incredible system. Works in- amazing. I think a lot of the trust that my daughter and I have and, and my son and I have is based off of the ability as a dad to be able to know if she was hungry or going to the bathroom or whatever from these grunts. But yeah, it it... it it's just an expression unless, until you either know how to author uh, the concept in, in a language or read or, you know, translate that, that language. And, mm-hmm. um, um, and so I think that's where like people who tend to lean towards that illustrative side, they're like saying, Hey, you know, this, this isn't just about me expressing myself on on a canvas is there has to be enough order to it so that someone else can receive it and get it and mm-hmm. and, and there's a responsibility uh, as an artist to do that um <clears throat> so yeah so well uh, actually you know we're gonna go ahead and try to wrap this conversation up um yeah <laughs> it, we went my brother yeah, yeah yeah we kind of went went on different tangent but um kiki question for you um there's a part of the conversation that i like to go into called agency which is mm-hmm. basically connecting and just kind of a- acknowledging that we're much bigger than just an artist isolated in a cabin somewhere near the lakes of michigan um mm-hmm. <laughs> And so I want to uh, give you an opportunity uh, to share, you know, maybe three people, businesses or services that you use to help you uh, do you, you know? Um, I guess. Um, well, Dick Blick, my art supply store, it's really freaking awesome. I really love Dick Blick. It's like going in there, it's like going like, it's like a Christmas every time you walk in there, you just get excited because you think about all the new stuff you can make. But you're like, I can't afford to buy a lot of stuff. So you go in there and you get whatever you need and leave. But yeah, Dick Blick, great, wonderful art store. Awesome. You know? And I, yeah, I'm, I mean, got Michael's or any any of those hobby stores around here, but I have to, I mean, the only real art store near me is Dick Blick, so I go there a lot. Um, and then I guess Instagram is great for getting I mean, any social media thing is great. Mm. Um, uh, so, you know, just guess getting in touch with people and connecting with people. So that's where the, the technology comes in and it's so good mm-hmm. is, is when, uh, we need to like, you know, me and you, you and I would have never been able to get connected if we didn't have all this, this technology. Mm-hmm. But that's where the light in the dark comes into play. It's like, it can be a, you know, it can be like an, a thing where we have too much of it, but mm-hmm. as long as you got to find balance between the light and the dark. And then, and if we never had the technology, I wouldn't be able to have this conversation with you because we would have never met. Mm-hmm. But um, so I think the technology and the, all the social media, like Facebook and that, and you know, and those things have negative aspects to it too. Well, Facebook posts fake news and this and that. Well, you got to be smart enough to like figure it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> use things, use things smart. You know, just be smart about it. Just whatever. You know, get over it. Um, awesome. Squarespace. <laughs> But seriously, like, that's what I mean. You can, there's a light in a dark and, and even the light can be centered, considered dark and the dark can be, can be considered the light side, you know, it's whatever your perspective is on things. And there's so many different perspectives. So you kind of have to just be open-minded. The world's completely nuts. But, um, so that, that Squarespace is, I did my website on Squarespace, which I really like. 
honestly. I think they have really clean designs. It's simple, it's easy, and it gets the job done. You can customize it a little bit if you want. And um, But, yeah, so, I mean, that's pretty pretty much it. But then um, I guess the gallery work um, I'm going to be working with eventually is uh, AFA Gallery. An AFA so, Gallery? What's that? AFA Gallery. Um, it's a gallery in New York and France. Oh, amazing fine cool. artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're really uh, the owner is really awesome, and it's, yeah, it's a really great gallery. So that's what I'm looking forward to is going to New York and visiting New York for the first time. Never been mm-hmm. there. I tend to be mm-hmm. more of a nature person, so big cities. I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is overwhelming. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the New York can get very. It's taken me twenty years to get used to it, and because uh, I remember right after college, I went up there and I was just like, "Oh my god, it's so big!" Like I, I remember leaving and like turning back and looking at the city and saying, "One day I'll come here, and uh, and we will see eyeball to eyeball," and. Uh, <sighs> The last time I was in New York, I was buzzing through going to the gallery, uh, to the uh, to the Met. I mean, and the energy, myself, my confidence, like um, it, 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 I, I just remember stopping and saying, "Ooh, I could actually live here." Like I felt oh, like really? I was ready. Like I, I personally was ready to take on that kind of energy and not be crushed by it, but actually become a, a contender in it. And it was, it, but yeah. it took me 20 years to kind of, you know, to come to that level of confidence in myself that I wouldn't be, you know, eaten up by this lion called the city. Um, yeah. But yeah, it takes, it takes time. Um, now I'm sure if you go in there and you just throw yourself in that situation and, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that probably would have accelerate it in one year experience instead of a 20 year experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, if you need any help, you gotta feel it out. Yeah, that's you what know, I'm gonna do is go feel it go out. Go feel it out. I think you would do very, very well there. To be quite honest, um, the uh, I think with your work ethic, um, and then you, you know you just have this coolness to you that um, at least I would I, I don't think you would have really a problem meeting people and getting connected with people. Um, mm-hmm. so when, when your work is ready, if, you know, I know the gallery up there, I had one of my students, we did a show up there and, um, it was a really beautiful gallery. It was a small one, but it was, it was beautiful cause it was on the, um, it was on the, uh, the roof of this, I think it was a big apartment building or something. And so it was a rooftop okay. gallery. So, you know, we had the little catered food and musicians and, and then you had the the gallery, and it was just gorgeous because you could just look over the city. Um, it was uh, it wasn't Manhattan, but it was down in Harlem. But uh, but it was it was it was cool. It was very very cool, uh, very cool experience. Um, Kiki, last question before I ask you to share your contact information uh, so people can get in touch with you. Um, but I have to ask you the most important question out of all of the stuff that we talked about, uh, you know, the death of the earth and all this other crazy stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> but most importantly, what do you like to eat? <laughs> this is the most important the question. Most important question because we can't end without food. Some, I go through like weird phases where I have to have this like one thing. Uh-huh. And, um, but lately I am kind of a, I'm pretty much a vegetarian, Okay. but I call myself a flexitarian because sometimes I'll dabble in meat. You know, so I'm like a flexible vegetarian, you know, it's just everything in moderation. So, um, but lately I do a lot of like vegetables with eggs or mm. one mm. of my, my favorite things is just peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like if I'm mm. having a craving or I like need to, yeah, just classic peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Do you ever go for the popcorn. goobers? The goobers? Oh my god! Are those like those pre? Oh, the oh the is it's that like the, like jelly the and peanut, the peanut butter, butter and jelly combined? Yeah, yeah. No, probably because they have high fructose corn syrup in it. 
<laughs> I'm like so I guess that's what I mean I like when you start reading about too much you're like well that's bad for you well that's bad for you well that's bad for you yeah it's not good for you at all it even tastes not good for you um <laughs> <laughs> Like that's just, how you know it tastes good it's like this is probably really bad for you me but it's really delicious at the same time yeah <laughs> but peanut butter do you like to eat your peanut butter and jelly with milk no i've never really done that actually i just oh eat it just God. i used to hate peanut butter when i was a kid really? i used to just have just jelly sandwiches swear <laughs> that's what my son and then after when i that's what my son does. He does the jelly sandwich, and my daughter doesn't like jelly. She only wants the peanut butter, so it's kind of weird. Like, here's your peanut butter sandwich. Here's your jelly sandwich. <laughs> now fight. No. But not have them together. Yeah, I'm the one who puts it together. Yeah, so. <laughs> Bill, they're tasteful change-minded. Like, after when I had pre- got pregnant, like, I don't know. I just have this weird, I have to have peanut butter. Like, I mm. love peanut butter now. That's so cool. now I do, like, a thick layer of peanut butter and a thin layer of jelly <laughs> ah, nice nice if you yeah. want to try it, it it may sound gross but it's actually really really good um if you make the peanut butter and jelly and then you cut it up and you dunk it in a glass of milk oh god it's something about that milk cold milk or when it, make, yeah. when it touches that jelly and then you have that oh my goodness it's like it's like the best donut ever, even though it's not a donut. It just tastes like a donut when you do it. Um, I'll try that. Yeah, because yeah, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, they're like dessert. It's not real food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It's like a dessert. Um, very cool. Well, Kiki, how can people get in touch with you? Um, they can get in touch with me. I guess through my email, my website. Um, my email is uh, Kristen K R I S T E N dot Donzilla D O N D Z I L A at gmail dot com, mm-hmm. or my website is Kiki Illustration dot com. So it's K I K I Illustration, but it's the words are just combined. Yeah. You know, there's no extra I. It's not K I K I I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's kikiillustration.com. But yeah, That's without cool. the extra I. Yeah. Just one I. Just one I. Actually, just two I's, but not three. Te- yeah. Technically, mm-hmm. two I's, not three I's. Yeah. It's Kiki with two I's. Um, or you could just Google my name and you will find my uh, website and anything. Very yeah, just cool. type my name into Google. It'll come up. <laughs> and I'll and I'll take uh, the the uh, email address and the um to your website link and put it in the show notes so that it's right attached to the uh, to the notes. So they can just click click on it and go over to your website. Um, cool, cool conversation. I'm glad we got to talk and uh, uh, maybe we'll do it an, another time. So yes, yeah, yeah. This enjoy was lots your of fun. Really Enjoy like your it. mural, and uh, um, I really I, I can see you doing a lot of them actually. So I really hope that works out for you. Um, Thank you. They're very very cool. All right, I'll talk to you later then. Okay. Maybe I'll. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Don Victor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Hi there, my name is Lori Calabrese. I'm an artist from Pennsylvania, and I wanted to share with you why I took 480 and and what I got from it. So I took 480 because I wanted to improve my skill set as an artist, right? I wanted to get to the next level. And uh, while my art has been well received, I felt that I feel that my art lacks uh, a level of elegance and sophistication that, that I wanted to have. And I knew to get to that level, I would have to improve my composition and design skills. So I enrolled in Core 80. In Core 80, we took deep dives into masterpieces. We analyzed line, brush strokes, spacing. We analyzed relationships between all the components of the piece. We started seeing the relationship that a main focal point, whether it's a face, an arm, a flower, uh, we started seeing the relationship that has with 
something on the other side of the painting that is not even noticeable. Uh, and it's amazing. So we drew these relationships and we drew and we drew and we analyzed and you saw what you ended up seeing. What unfolded was the intent behind the masterpiece. You got into the artist's head. It was amazing. It was exciting. I felt connected to masters in a way that I never have before. And I was so excited. And now I have this skill set, right? I have the skill set. I have um, the concept behind it. And I can apply these techniques to my work. So now I will use this and I will use these skills to take the story that I'm painting, right? Why am I painting a piece? What, what is my intent? What is the story that I'm getting across? And I will use these design concepts to lead the viewer into my story. And while the viewer, they're consciously, they might not be able to understand all the relationships that I created, the subconscious will put the pieces together. So I'm um, very excited, very happy, and, uh, and I look forward to watching my work become sophisticated and elegant and, and the level that I want it to be. Thanks. In just 30 days, the Core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces. Through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a seven-day no-hassle money-back guarantee at core80.com.